So, dear colleagues, it's uh, one minute after five. I welcome you uh, to a webinar of the West Class section of the ENS again. Um, in the last four webinars, we have had a focus on um, aneurysms and on cover um, Now we're dealing with a, let's say, a bit less sexy topic, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, one of the most important topics in vascular neurosurgery, the management of intracerebral hemorrhages. Uh, we have a well-known expert uh, giving his lecture. It's um, Jürgen Beck uh, from uh, Freiburg University Hospital, um, who is one of um, the masterminds of the SWITCH study. Um, I think the only ongoing ICH study um, in the moment. I'm quite happy that Jürgen is here. Uh, his, the, talk, uh, the topic of his talk is ICH, Neurosurgical Treatment Perspective. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to hear what you're uh, telling us, Jürgen. The stage is yours. Dear Fights, dear friends, dear colleagues, thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to, to present. I'm sharing my screen. And... Probably you see the images right now? Yes, perfect. Okay. So let's get started. Um, I'm happy to present you our thoughts in Freiburg about intracerebral hemorrhage and about the neurosurgical treatment perspectives. These are Jürgen, my disclosures. Jürgen, Jürgen, just a moment. Yes. I forget it in the, in the introduction. Um, please, if you have <clears throat> any questions, just put them in, um, not in the chat, um, but in the um, answer box. Uh, and and, and um, question box. Um, otherwise, it's it's uh, quite difficult to select um, the um, questions, um, which for the discussion afterwards. Okay, so now we go on, please, Jürgen. Okay, these are my disclosures for intracranial hemorrhages, and just to say hello from Freiburg, beautiful city in the southern part of Germany, on the left and uh, close to the, the bottom of the Schwarzwald which is uh, quite nice, quite nice. And you can hear, you can even see the Hotzenwald, which is a very magic space as well to you. This is our university hospital, the campus. Here is a so-called neuro center where we have uh, six theaters running, uh, even, even up to now in these times. And today we had the pleasure to have a real giant of neurosurgery, of European neurosurgery here. Professor Mark Sindhu was here giving lectures and showing videos and was joining for the surgery. But coming to the topic of today, intracerebral hemorrhage, usually we think hypertension is the reason for intracranial hemorrhage, for spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage. And tiny, tiny microaneurysms, Charcot Bouchard aneurysms of the perforating vessels are thought to be the reason for ICH. And here is an old study showing us where these tiny microaneurysms micro are. And all the, the aneurysms and the bleeds in the basal ganglia, and the thalamus, and the pons, and the cerebellum are thought to be typical ICH, whereas the rest, meaning for you, the cerebral cortex is thought to be atypical in location. But most of them are probably also like to the hypertensive changes of the small perforating arteries. There's another small vessel disease coming to the focus in recent years, which is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a frequent cause in the oldest people or the older people of rather cortical and recurrent, very high risk of recurrent um, intracerebral hemorrhage. So it's not a uniform disease. You see how heterogeneous ICH is, and beginning with the small, tiny, tiny bleeds superficial bleeds, the classic basal ganglia, hi, uh, hypertensive uh, bleed, um, hemorrhages that are usually not, not connected to a good prognosis, and these more cortical bleeds, finger-like extrusions, which are most likely to be CAA amyl amyloid angiopathy related. To give you the biggest or the most important numbers on an outcome is, of course, we, we need to consider size. So 30 cc, 30 mils, is an important landmark. And here for deep hemorrhages, and you see in this classic old studies from Broderick that in hemorrhages above 30 cc, 
almost all patients die. This is a, there's a different threshold for the lower hemorrhages, it's twice as big, so 60 cc, 60 mLs. And over the threshold of 60 cc's, there are more, more, more people dead than, um, than survivors, um, just concerning size and just concerning the dichotomy between lower and basal ganglia bleeds. There's an update of this fancy global burden of disease study um, of Ms. Feigen, just published in Lancet Neurology. And you see the, the typical incidence of ICH, which is thought to be 15 or 20 per 100,000, is just, just goes for, for Northern America and Europe and Australia. There's a tremendous difference in incidence in Asia and in Africa. There's an incidence of up to five times as high, up to 100 um, bleeds per 100,000 inhabitants per year. And the authors even claim air pollution to be the most important risk factor in Asia as opposed to hypertensive, uh, uh, high, high blood pressure in, in the Western countries. So, but coming now to specific therapy, unfortunately, we haven't we haven't been successful to prove that this ugly clot is, is, is beneficial for the patient when we take the clot out. But this goes not only for neurosurgery, this goes for any specific measure. There is no one specific therapy or one specific drug that improves outcome um, and has been proven to improve outcome in, in good quality RCTs. So let's talk about stabilizing, evacuating, and protecting from secondary injury. This is what we as neurosurgeons probably can, can, uh, can focus on. So the biggest issue is that um, almost all bleeds enlarge, or there's re-bleeding, or there's constant bleeding in the first hours after, after the ictus. So the major problem is size is related to outcome, and size increases, most likely very early on. So how can we stop this bleed? And the first two, two issues are blood pressure and coagulation. Because we are confronted with blood pressure reduction, it's a logical consequence, a good idea, to, to lower the pressure in the pipe to stop enlarge, uh, hem the hemorrhage from enlarging. And the Interact studies, Interact 2, excellent study, almost 3,000 patients by Craig Anderson was done. And please have a look at the size. This is important for us neurosurgeons. The median volume that was uh, looked at in these studies was 11 cc's. So these are not the bleeds the neurologist is calling you in the middle of the night to take them out. They are small bleeds. And even in the small bleeds, there was no significant um, um, decrease in the enlargement of the, of the bleeds. So the primary outcome uh, was also only marginal positive with a P of 0.06, whatever this means, but the rational behind it. So meaning that if you lower the, the pressure in the pipe, there is less neurologic deterioration the first 24 hours or there's less deterioration from intracerebral hemorrhage was not the case at all. As you can see here, um, the P was 0.4 or 0.6. And there was no difference in between these two groups. So there was no change in volume and hemorrhages. There was no change in neurologic deterioration the first 24 hours and only a trend for a better outcome. Maybe it's true, but remember mean volume of, of these patients, 11 cc's, 11 milliliters. Then there was attack two. They even more aggressively lowered blood pressure in the acute situation. You can see here in the, in the diagram, standard treatment was uh, 140 millimeters of mercury and the aggressive attack two treatment paradigm was 120 or below. And again, 10 cc's, 10.3 cc's was the medium volume of the, of the hemorrhage in, over, in exactly 1,000 patients. And again, there was no difference at all in outcome. So um, even in standard treatment, the, the very best patients were a little bit more frequent than in the aggressive treatment patients. As always with these studies, they pooled it and there was a meta-analysis of the individual patient data. And suddenly, I'm not a statistician, but suddenly there is a, a signal that's probably um, not statistically significant for, for a good outcome, but probably 
for enlargement of the clot, it might be best that um, the blood pressure initially is 120 to 140. And, but please keep in mind, there are no data for large hematomas above 30 cc's or more that we are usually see um, as new researchers. And there's um, some, some randomized data, recent randomized data, 2019. And here we have a cohort of patients with 30 cc's or more. And uh, look at this, it was associated, aggressive initial blood pressure reduction was associated with a worse functional outcome, not reaching exactly significance, but close to. So there might be a signal that it's only valid, blood pressure reduction is only valid for small little bleeds. A very promising medication is tramexamic acid. It's very often used in cardiac surgery, in obstetric surgery. And there was a nice study by Nicholas Brick published last year or two years ago in, in The Lancet. And unfortunately, even giving, uh, or given uh, tramexamic acid in the early phase of intracranial hemorrhage, there was no change in outcome, unfortunately. But, two, but as opposed to the, to the blood pressure studies, there was at least a signal for the rationale that if you apply tranexamic acid early, there's significantly less change in volume. There are significantly less patients with hematoma expansion and significantly less patients die in the first week. So it's still a promising drug, I think, tranexamic acid. Coming to surgery. So if we, if we look at all the trials that have been done in a meta-analysis, there is, if you mix them all together, back and forth, some studies uh, proved to be beneficial, some don't, some didn't, but there was no clear trend. And if you mix them all together, you can find a signal, significant signal, but to be honest, the benefit was not consistent and the studies are of poor quality, so these results are not really reliable. So we look at a more recent meta-analysis done by the Dutch group last year, and again, if you mix them all together, there is a benefit of surgery. So we can do, we can go on with surgery for our patients if you refer to this meta-analysis. And the same goes for open surgery as well as for minimal invasive surgery. So there is no real difference, both are beneficial. But if you only look at the high quality studies at the random, big randomized controlled trials, you clearly see the effect is gone. This is just the stitch one, stage two, and the MISTI trials, and there is no significant effect anymore left. So what do we do? We, we, let's look at the trials. Let's look at the first big randomized controlled trial of perfect, perfect standards performed by David Mendelo and his team. And if you look at the results, you have to color the graph to discriminate the early surgical group from the initial conservative group. So there was no difference at all here in the probability of survival. Disappointing. What do we do when we have a big study? We go into the data and do post hoc analysis, and there was a group that did well, did better with surgery, and this was the group of patients with superficial bleeds, one centimeter or less from the cortical surface. And a strong signal, too. There was also a group that did not only not benefit, but that did worse with surgery, with initial surgery, and was, that was the group of patients deeply comatose with a GCS of eight or less. So in this case, of course, it was probably quite clear for a lot of us, let's do stitch two. David Mendelo did it again, just including superficial groups because the deep ones were out. Now superficial ones are, are en vogue and in, and it's easy to remove them, though we can prove uh, benefit for, of, of surgery for this group of patients, and we have uh, level one evidence treatment. So stitch two came out in 2013, and again, very disappointing, it was neutral. There was no benefit of early surgery of superficial ICH. Again, look at it, significant bleeds around 40 cc's in size, and there was no real difference. Um, of early surgery and, and initial consultative treatment. We look into the data and even a meta-analysis fails to prove effectiveness, but only when you look at prognosis groups, and this was pre-specified very clever by David Menlo. If you look at the poor prognosis group, then you, you see a strong signal that, when, that surgery is of benefit, 
And what is the poor prognosis group in terms of GCS? It is between eight and 13 or between nine and 12. This is the poor prognosis group. And these patients, there seems to be a signal for these patients with a GCS of nine to 12, that they are most likely to benefit from surgical evacuation. So the other rationalists and, and uh, Veit Rode uh, published a lot about this topic. Here you see an example of uh, deep hemorrhages that can be extracted minimal invasively by a stereotactic or frameless stereotactic aspiration. And there might be a window of opportunity that is larger or longer than in ischemic stroke, as you can see here. There is a significant formation of edema up to 14 days. And it, it can't be good that this bleed stays in the brain exerting all the pressure for such a long period of time. So maybe a little bit delayed stereotactic aspiration might very well be a very intelligent and valid approach. Here you see some quantitative data, edema development indeed in, in, um, in, in red stroke develops over 14 days as opposed to ischemic stroke. This was the rationale for the MISTI trials. A decade long endeavor, very clever planned. And you see here inserting of a drain of a tube, um, re reduction of the volume and the installation of RTPA over several days to lyse the clots to prevent this excessive edema formation. And we have the, the uh, phase three trial being published two years ago, and it was a clever trial, clever planned trial with using navigation, minimal invasive techniques, aspiration of the clot and RTPA installation over several days. So really minimal invasive surgery at its best. And this is the, the primary outcome slide. So again, big disappointment. There was no effect at all. Again, the, the best the patient group um, was six times um, higher than in the, in the, in the Verum group. And there was no real difference in this outcome. This is an adjusted outcome for hemorrhage size, glascocoma stale, stability of interventricular size, and so on. And we really can't see a signal for this excellent performed trial. Luckily, the authors provide us with the unadjusted um, results too in the appendix on page 15. So this is a value to compare probably best with stitch one and stitch two. And you see there's, it's neutral, there's no clear signal. Some people say, okay, but mortality, we can reduce mortality. This has been proven by MISTI-3. I don't think so. If you look at the, at the results slide, you see, okay, there's a difference between um, 48 people died in the Verum group versus 62 in the, in the standard medical, best medical care group, which is a delta of 14. But if you look, it's not a blinded procedure. One group has an operation and there is a tube sticking out of your head and the other group has best medical, not blinded. You cannot blind the, the procedure. And I come to that later with the, the withdrawal of care discussion. There were out of these 14 people different uh, that made the Delta and the mortality group, nine had withdrawal, nine more had withdrawal of care in the standard medical care group. Additionally, over 50 hypotheses have been tested. So I think it's not proven yet, but there's a very interesting signal in MISTI. They really looked quantitatively at the end of treatment volume. So how much blood is left after surgery? And there seems to be a kind of a magic threshold, 15 cc or more is not of help. You have to reduce the blood clot to 15 cc or less can you yield a significant result. So another strong signal is that the prognosis wasn't uh, so poor as thought. It was significant bleeding volume, 40 cc or more, and 80% of the survivors were living at home or in active rehab. So the prognosis might be better than thought. And there's a strong signal that 15 cc seems to be a threshold that we should aim for. It was a very well conducted study, training phase, uh, centralized reading and so forth, but still it was unfortunately neutral and difficult to compare with the adjusted analysis, but luckily the unadjusted endpoint is given as well, which you can see here. So all the big RCTs are neutral. So, this is it, this is it, this was the story? No, I don't think so. And is it only about minimal invasiveness? 
Of course, surgical technique matters, but timing matters, patient characteristic matters, the size matters, location, where is the bleed, and our mindset matters. So why did all these studies fail? I personally think, and this is probably also current thinking, we've, we've done too little, too late. And if you look at the time to treatment from the ictus, it was 26 or 30 hours in stitch, and it was over two and a half days in MISTI. How do we think we can do any benefit to our patients if you look at ischemic stroke? And there are many experimental data that it might be the same in hemorrhagic stroke. For instance, if you look at, again, tranexamic acid in traumatic hemorrhage in the crash three trials, there is a clear signal that if you apply tranexamic acid, you have a better outcome. And the window of opportunity, the window of treatment is as in ischemic stroke in the first minutes to hours, not in the first days. This is a very nice study by um, Rastam Al-Shahi. And you see here the initial phase after the ictus, this is the phase where the hemorrhage, where the clot enlarges, not so much over the next day. So probably um, the most interesting time period is as in ischemic stroke, the first hours. Then go back to the, to the data, Look at our patients and you see that there is um, original data from, from, from seven studies that patients that have been operated in the first hour, eight hours, do better. Then there is a recent um, retrospective trial, a very nice trial published last month. And you can see that also with endoscopic surgery, the benefit, um, the benefit shows up when you operate patients the first 15 or 20 hours, then the benefit is lost. So not only timing, also patient characteristics, what kind of patients we select for the studies matters, of course. And let's look at the meta-analysis again. And you can see that age is of concern, probably 50 to 70. GCS, again, 9 to 12 has the strongest signal. Patients not too poor and patients not completely awake seem to benefit the most volume 20 to 50, and again, GCS um, is probably even worse if you operate on deeply comatose patients. Then they did a more elaborate meta-analysis of the individual data of these studies. Barbara Gregson published it uh, two years ago, and the same goes for this um, more, more sophisticated analysis concerning clock volume only after 20, 25 cc's this line opens and there seems to be a benefit and not in the tiny clots that have been looked at in Interact and TAC2 in, um, in the blood pressure studies. Again, GZS in a better analysis and you see that probably at seven, eight, the lines separate and you can con confer a benefit for the patients which diminishes in the completely awake patients. So probably trivial, but not so trivial. There are maybe just two the reasons um, stitch one and stitch two fail is not surgery is, 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 uh, is poor, but we have mixed patients that benefit with, with patients that we might harm and they are too, too, too good or too bad, uh, so to say, when they are in a, in a very bad shape. So GCS 10 to 13 or 8 to 14 seems to be the range that is of benefit. What happens then in, in real life? Um, there's a there is a disease, we have no clear proof and in intervention. So in the beginning, we, we maybe we do nothing because there is no proven benefit for surgery. So we wait and the patient deteriorates, probably still young, 64, then develops blown pupils. And then we rush to the OR and evacuate or decompress hematoma. I think that's not what we should do. It's too late. And the stitch trials has shown that GCS of ADLS is probably not a good idea. But this study retrospective, but they looked exactly at the situation of deteriorating patients. And if you look at the results, once you've lost brainstem reflexes, all patients invariably die. So it's not a good idea to wait and then to run to the OR in the middle of the night. We also know very well that location matters. So um, from almost 3,000 patients from the INTERACT study, we now have very good data that, of course, the thalamus and the posterior number of the internal capsule are associated with a very poor prognosis. 
And then we have, might have a magic pill. This is a very interesting study where you can see a halving of mortality over all groups of ICH severity mixed together and all groups, the, the mortality is half or even less than half with this treatment. What's, what is it? What is it? It's just our mindset. It was prospective and it was a, um, a stop of DNR of the do not resuscitate orders for the first 48 hours. If you wait with these orders, then we have a clearly better prognosis. And this was also shown by MISTI that the prognosis of ICH isn't as bad as we thought. So it's worthwhile at least to, to delay DNR orders or withdrawal of care for, for two days. This was also shown if you apply a bundle um, of, of approaches, the ABC care bundle approach as was done by Perry Jones. And you can see that if you adhere to a strict protocol to a SOP, if you follow guidelines for anticoagulation reversal, blood pressure control, and neurosurgery for selected patients, you can have a dramatic um, impact on outcome. And you authors claim by themselves that probably the withdrawal of care delay and the clear protocols um, have the most effect. And you cannot tell which one of the A, B, or C is responsible for that but they claim that probably adherence to clear protocols and no withdrawal of care orders have the most impact. So what, what else it is? It's, is it the surgery technique? Of course, it's important whether we open the skull or we put a catheter in minimum, basically. But of course, there is more. There's hemostasis, extent of resection. Misty showed us the 15 cc's threshold the tools we use, how much of the toxic products we get out, and so forth. And after the failure of stitch one and stitch two, everybody claimed that, of course, it's the access to the lesion. And I don't believe that. It's not of any importance whether the endoscope is 0.8 or 1.2 centimeters. It really matters what we do down here. So if, for instance, the perihematoma zone can recover, the penumbra can recover, or it can go down and die like in ischemic stroke. But if the neurosurgeon come, comes into place here, this is a penumbra. What happens to this tissue? This is very eloquent tissue like the posterior limb of the internal capsule. If the neurosurgeon comes into place, you can, it can be removed, it can be destroyed. So there is no possibility for recovery. And that very tiny, small perforators from the choroidal artery that supply the posterior limb of the internal capsule, they are calculated quite easy, even via an endoscope, not only via open craniotomy. So I think it matters what we do deep down here and not the access is the issue, the surgery itself impacts outcome. So what is minimal invasive? Minimal invasiveness refers, I think, to our whole, whole neurosurgical craftsmanship and not only to bony opening or the size or the color of the endoscope or whether you have high definition of 4K or 8K, I think that's not so relevant. How do you, you handle the arteries and the veins that you use irrigation, avoid coagulation, that you use, that you operate an ICH, not a tumor and don't follow the border and remove um, the border zone that you, really know how much to remove. Probably you have to define the lower border. Of course, you have no go areas and probably it's important to remove as much, as much blood as possible. So this was nicely shown by this work. This is already one, uh, one decade old that we should not operate a bleed like a tumor following the, the border zone and remove it completely. No, just stick, and it doesn't matter whether you look through an endoscope or a microscope, but just stick it in and let the, the blood come into the tube, into the, the sheath and, and uh, withdraw it slowly and irrigate a lot, use hemostatic material, don't coagulate. And then you are able to remove, I mean, this is a retrospective study. I'm just focusing on the technique, not so much on the outcome because it's retrospective, but it were significant hemorrhages and they managed to remove all the blood in the first 12 hours and even 84% of them were operating in the first, first four hours. So very early and they had 
this, this, this bundle approach that you use, a lot of irrigation, uh, only rarely coagulation, hemostasis with hemostatic material. And of course, you can use an endoscope or flexible endoscope for, um, for visualization. So it's not so important. These are self-made tubes in the studies, whether you have this um, you know, industry driven tubes or just a plastic tube, please follow the minimal invasive surgical, neurosurgical principles to remove the clot. And of course we can use new techniques and elegant new covered tools. For instance, the, the, um, the penumbra device, we can use endoscopically or wire a sheath to remove the clot as minimal as invasive as possible. And that's what we do here in Freiburg too. I think that's what we should do. We should be fast. We remove, should remove a lot of clot and we do it minimal invasively as a part of a minimal invasive bundle approach that can be done endoscopically, as you can see here, typical bleed. And we use an endoscope, not in uh, any plastic sheath, sheath that is uh, translucent, just an endoscope. And this penumbra device where there is no um, dangerous or rotating tool outside of the sheath, it's all covered. So probably that's part of the game that you cannot do any harm with the suction device. And the principle is that you basically operate inside the tube, let the hemorrhage develop inside to the tube and don't manipulate the very fragile tissue in the depth of the brain, in the depth of the basal ganglia. So the approach is alongside the long axis. So it doesn't matter if you do the burr hole in the, in the, in the, in the, in the forehead and go alongside the axis and this is one of these videos. What you see is in the beginning, just nothing, because that's one, one principle, use a lot of irrigation and stay inside of the tube and the hematoma, the clot develops inside the tube and you can then time by time, you can activate this rotor and the suction device and the clot that is, enters the tube is, is removed again. I think this is a very gentle and a very, um, smooth way to remove the clot. So only after, after a couple of seconds or minutes, we enter the, the cavity for the first time, and then you are able to remove more and more clot. We retract the suction and the rotating device inside the, the sheath of the endoscope, as you can see here. And so you, you, you don't do any harm. So these are the results. And um, of course, you need, to, you need to have prospective trials to prove that it is good. The images look nice, but we have to prove that it's good uh, concerning the outcome. And it's not proven yet that very early surgery, like in the first four hours, is beneficial. There are some studies that, it, you, that you might harm patients, but these studies um, included only a handful of patients. So I think it's really worthwhile, really worthwhile to try to be as early as possible. You also can combine all these principles as was nicely shown here in the Berlin group uh, paper, minimal invasive techniques, small sheaths, neural navigation, also an uh, elaborate advanced uh, suction rotation device for removing the off the clot and additional intraoperative imaging for end of treatment control, very important. When you, when you think of um, being minimal invasive, you can switch to, to the opposite direction and leave the brain um, intact at all and only remove the bone. This, of course, is the principle in, in decompressive craniectomy for ischemic stroke. And remember, we don't do a lesionectomy in ischemic stroke. And the lesion is way bigger in ischemic stroke, 300, 400 cc's as compared to 30 cc's in hemorrhagic stroke. And this is a proven, proven procedure only to decompress. And there's a, a ton, a plethora of toxic elements in this dying brain tissue as well. So it's very, very, um, it's, it's worthwhile thinking about decompression surgery alone. So there are these, uh, some old slides of mine where you can see the pressure exerted on the midline. There's also 
um, an area with a clear penumbra and a reduced perihemorrhagic zone. And so probably it's, it's an ischemic mechanism that leads to, to tissue damage in the vicinity of the clot. And this is not, not self-evident because um, even the best neurologists, stroke neurologists told us 20 years ago, there is no penumbra in ischemic stroke. And maybe that's true, but look at the numbers. Again, look at the numbers. The medium volume of this landmark study was again only 10 cc's. These, these hemorrhages are too small for us neurosurgeons. And they looked at the tiny hemorrhage and the tiny zone, perihemorrhagic zone, and there was, there was a MTG prolongation and a misery perfusion, but it didn't reach the classic numbers defined for ischemic stroke, four to six seconds or greater six, six seconds um, tissue perfusion delay. It's, it's not an ischemic penumbra, but it's probably an hemorrhagic penumbra. This paper was very influential not to act on ICH because there is no, no salvageable tissue. I think that's not true. And if we look at surgically relevant hemorrhages like the Dusseldorf group did here, 70 milliliters, you clearly can see a difference before and after surgery. So the, the perfusion can be reversed in the vicinity of the tissue in almost all patients, only just one outlier here. And so it's very worthwhile. You find DVE lesions, you find ischemic tissue um, in the vicinity of hemorrhages as well in more modern MRI studies. And even in randomized controlled trials, it could have been shown um, that if you measure in the very close vicinity to a bleed in the border zones, in the internal and external border zones, there is a significant reduction of perfusion in ICH. Very important, I think. And so there is, to show it to you graphically, there's a very tiny, but in, in, in some significant uh, rim of significant tissue misery perfusion. There's an even larger rim of misery perfusion um, that probably persists over 14 days, as I have shown you in these images with a significant edema that can do a lot of harm. And there's misery perfusion in the internal and external border zones. So there is salvageable tissue in ICH. And therefore, you can leave this vulnerable brain alone and can do because surgery not only access matters, only surgery itself in the depth of the brain matters. You can leave the brain alone, decompress the brain, remove the bone, and with the prospect that probably the patients recover that the posterior part of the internal capsule recovers and they are not hemiplegic and then you can put the bone flap back in. So this was the, the rationale for the SWITCH trial together with Andreas Rabe, with um, Boris Fischer, Christian Frank who developed this trial and did it randomized. And this is, as you can see, the same thinking goes for, for, for this trial, GCS between seven and 14, not the very poor patients, not the very best patients, this group probably is the most reasonable. And it is a slim trial, a lean trial, just best medical treatment compared to best medical and DC decompressive craniectomy. So it's a European endeavor. And in the meantime, we've managed to include 172 patients as of today. I think Göttingen has included, Professor Milke has included a patient today. So, and when we have reached 200, um, then we stop and then we will have a result probably in one year or even earlier. Really, very excited whether we do benefit or harm with this concept. Probably more important for um, um, a bigger group of patients is um, following early surgery, early removal of the hematoma. And I think a very good study is the Dutch ICH surgery trial. And the abstract of the pilot trial has just recently been published on the ESAP conference, and you see with a modern paradigm, controlling for all these factors I've, I've tried to, to tell you in the last minutes is, is, is doable, it's achievable. And the time from onset to, to removal of the hematoma was only six hours, not three or four days, just six hours, with a very high quality, 82% volume reduction. And I think that's the way to go and I'm looking very much forward to the results of this prospective randomized controlled trial, hopefully starting soon. So we have more and more options. And I think the, the picture is getting a little bit clearer that we do not 
operate or shall not operate in the very tiny bleeds and not on the patients with a, with a, a very poor prognosis. Between 30 and probably 100 cc's, we should be early, probably very early. I think it's feasible, but still it has to be proven by RCT. And the GCS spectrum probably is from 7A to 13, 14, not the very poor patients and not the best patients. And uh, extent of treatment, of course, matters very well. And we have from due to MISTI now, kind of a threshold, maybe it's 15 cc's or around 15 cc's. So and what is what happens in daily life? These are the last 1000 bleeds here done in, in Freiburg. And you can see that we did more often perform any type of surgery than our best medical only. So we kind of personalized um, the treatments to our patients. And uh, what we did a lot is just um, um, so-called freehand drain of the bleed. So like a MISTI protocol, just without navigation, just put it in. And I think this can be done. We also aim for an EVD to, to target this, this ventricular. So we can also um, target on the, on, the, on the clot, which is two or three times as big. And it's, this is a valid approach. Of course, if the ICH is a little bit more higher, we can do open approaches, remove it surgically, open surgery and um, probably more sophisticated than the freehand drain is the, um, the navigated endoscopic removal we've just started on, very, very elegant approach. And I think this is probably uh, where the future is, but we have to prove it in RCTs. Also a rare example that, um, that uh, a borderline patient with a, a clot larger than three centimeters in the posterior fossa, but still quite good, was, was treated with a, with a, with a drain, freehand drain. Sometimes this, this is of help, so personalized treatment. And for instance, in this 75-year-old patient with a GCS of 10, and in this, this frontal clot, you don't need any sophisticated tools. You just do a small craniotomy, and the clot drains itself. There is the clot itself has done a small corticotomy and it oozes out. And of course, then you don't go in either with a microscope or with an endoscope and hunt the very last um, CC of blood here in the vicinity to the pyramidal tract with the corticospinal tract. So just let that come out what comes out. And I think you can infer benefit from these patients. A concept that is done and we also like very much is that once you have a clot and you put a, dr a drain in freehand or navigate it, but if there is some CSF oozing out from the parenchyma into the clot, this helps with clearance and maybe these subgroup of patients have a better outcome. So personalize your approach to your specific patient. This is an instant, an example of, of such an approach. Um, remove the clot and insert the drain into the, the ventricle and the CSF is kind of clearing the, the hemorrhage uh, and have, helps with the clearance of the hemorrhage. So one, one summary is, of course, we can go on with surgery. There's some meta-analysis and we can we have good tools for selecting the best patients. We have much more data now that we can interpret, that we can find patient groups, selected patients for surgery. The outcome, if you have the mindset um, of a more aggressive treatment, the outcome might be way better than we saw. And I think the, the doing, don't do nothing in the initial phase and then probably rush for rescue surgery for deeply comatose patients with loss of brainstem reflexes is not the approach of choice. And of course, we shall continue with surgery in the setting of trials. Concerning the our VOC, um, um, the topic minimal invasive surgery, I think it's not it's not the endoscope, it's not the access, it's a minimal invasive paradigm or whole craftsmanship that we really use, of course, endoscopes and sheaths and, and small, small incisions, but it's only one part of the game. Of course, it's minimal invasive that you handle the arteries and veins carefully, that you avoid coagulation, gross coagulation in the depth of the basal ganglia, use irrigation, gentle pressure, hemostyptica. Um, careful tissue handling, it's not a tumor where you have to develop the, 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 the border plane between normal tissue, completely normal tissue and the clot, no, just relief 
um, as much as is possible with tiny or no handling of the parenchyma at all. Um, extent of treatment matters, 15 cc, it's a good border now, it's a good, good threshold now. Uh, of course, respect, we know what's eloquent, what's not eloquent, we know this is neurosurgeon. Respect the internal capsule and the thalamus and consider to remove as much blood as possible. This is the whole minimal invasive bundle I think we should use. And once you engage in a study, you take, take part in a trial, please be sure that you follow the protocol. Don't think during the trial, okay, now I believe surgery is better than best medical treatment and switch patients back and forth. This kills any study. And um, once you decided to take part in a study, then you need the equipoise principle don't believe you know it better for um, during the, the, the run of the, of the study because again, crossover kills all studies and uh, we will never be able to find a positive result, a positive trial that we then can um, expand to all our patients. So avoid crossing over once you've taken part in the trial. So that's it. Um, I think um, these are our thoughts from, from, from Freiburg. And um, I was happy to share it with you. And uh, thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for this uh, beautiful talk. Um, we have uh, more than 200 participants, which is a lot. Um, hearing uh, this um, webinar. I'm quite astonished that we only have one question. But uh, I have on the list a few questions uh, which um, I will ask and uh, possibly my questions will stimulate the others to raise their questions. Um, first, I pick the question from the uh, question and answer section. Um, there was a question about uh, fibrinolytic therapy. I think you touched this already with a MISTI trial. Um, but possibly, Jürgen, you can just summarize a bit um, the, the current data on fibrinolytic therapy in ICH. It's, of course, um, an excellent idea to lyse the clot and to remove it slowly once it's fluid. You don't have to, uh, you can do this really minimum, basically. But unfortunately, the current data um, is not sufficient to say that this is of any benefit. And um, probably some, some issues why it didn't work. It takes time. It just takes hours or days until you can lyse the clot, until the clot is fluid and probably um, we are too late. So it takes too much time. Um, others have raised the issue that uh, RTPA is toxic. It's toxic for the brain. Um, it is in, in animal experiments. And if you look at the, um, the MISTI data, um, the very best patients, so the, with the MRS of, of, of zero, no, no deficit, were six times more frequent in the best medical group as compared to the RTPA group. So probably there is a signal for, for toxicity of RTPA. I don't know. It's not significant. But um, if you ask my interpretation of the current data, I think very intelligent, but it takes too much time. Okay, so um, I, in the moment, I would like to stick to, to this part of thinking. Um, we have thought, as you said, since, since I think 25 years, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the fibrotic therapy and we have um, also made some studies on it. And we thought about some thing of, let's say, hyperfibrinolysis because a half lift time of TPA is only half an hour. Um, and you raise the issue of, um, of time. You're completely right. It takes too much time until the clot is reduced to 15 uh, mils. But if you speed up the elimination of the clot by giving TPA uh, much more frequently, what do you think about this idea? Would it increase the risk for the patients or would it be something which also in your thinking could be a valuable way to go? 
Clearly, concerning the, the pathophysiology, I think it would be worthwhile doing, being faster. But um, then, of course, the question um, arises, if you do very high frequently installation of something, train it out again, why not just simply doing surgery right from the start? Because then you achieve ultra early removal of the clot in, in an instant with, with the surgery, with the procedure itself. So um, I think it's worthwhile doing it. And if we consider it not toxic, I would at least in expert hands, as you are in your group, you have a tremendous experience with your tactic aspiration and, and license of these clots. I would, I would do go for a pilot. Because our idea is, just to say it, um, that you don't harm the small vessels which are at risk if you're using the endoscope or if you go in and microscopically because, and therefore I was not so happy with a freehand drain, I must say, because I, I always, our credo is the drain should be in the middle of the clot. And if you're in the middle of the clot, you have a very smooth lysis of the hematoma, but you have no risk of bleeding at the borders and you don't harm the small vessels. So that's a, that's a that the idea and um, possibly we should proceed with a, a yeah. high frequent fibrotic therapy. Okay. Yeah, and and um, when I when I might add something to it, of course I think this is this is what I always try to tell, and I showed this uh, wonderful big picture of of um, Ruben Ruben uh, in his publication with the tiny perforators. If if you go into the basal ganglia and do gross coagulation in the middle of the night, the bipolar highest setting, it doesn't matter whether you use an endoscope or microscope or whatsoever, you destroy everything. And I think this is at least from the, from the thinking, the same mindset as when you tell us to try to hyperlyze it because it's all about small, tiny vessels that are end arteries supplying very eloquent brain. Okay, so I would like to go to the questions. I think my first question stimulated a bit the, the crowd. There's a um, question from Ari Delgado. Um, no, yeah, there are two questions from Ari Delgado. Um, he's asking first, or he or she is asking first, um, has emulization any role in your opinion? This is an excellent question. So I think there might be a role for embolization. I suppose embolization of the ruptured vessel, but it's currently not possible to reach it safely and early. And then what do you do? Um, this is so tiny, usually 100 to 500 microns. So you cannot enter that specific vessel that rupture. And then you have the same as if you coagulate all the tiny vessels from the outside, if you close the whole uh, branching system, the lenticular strike arteries from the inside, you have the same. You destroy your, your valid tissue bit by inducing more ischemia. So in theory, it's good. Practically not doable at the moment. Um, then the two questions are linked. Uh, it's a question about how to treat the patient I, I, either after surgery or um, without any surgery. Uh, the question is about deep sedation, the role of deep sedation, um, and um, the role of any ICP monitoring. And um, I would like also ask you if you decide to perform conservative management in, um, let's say, comatose patients, do you perform ICP monitoring, yes or no? Um, too seldom. I think we should do, we should insert ICP probes more often. I'm not a friend of um, letting patients uh, deeply sedated. I think there is no benefit at all. We, you can always stop. We have so good, medi we have uh, good medications with short half times. We can stop sedation. And um, um, you see immediately if the ICP rises or there's some adverse reaction, you can resedate them. So leaving patients over days into deep coma is not a good idea in my opinion. And um, of course we should use ICP probes more liberally in, in, ICP, in ICH patients 
and um, considering the local pressure and the general ICP issues. And it would be good to leave an ICP probe in the cavity, for instance, but we don't do this on a regular basis either. We should do it more often. I think there's a very challenging question from Alejandra Mostero. Um, she asks, what about local stem cell therapy after hematoma evacuation? Of course. That's after all um, damage has happened and everything is kind of broken, we can restore function. Of course, there is, but I think since 15 years, there are, there are many studies trying, animal studies, uh, bench studies, trying to, to give stem cells. This is beyond the scope of this talk. I, I, I showed you in the beginning, um, stabilize the clot, evacuate, evacuate the clot and, and prevent secondary damage. Once the damage happened, uh, restore the brain is interesting, of course, but there's current, currently no paradigm that is emerging that we can um, use for, for ICH patients. Okay. Uh, I think there is one uh, <clears throat> a practical question and it's a bit related to the surgical techniques. You are using a fibro. Um, Konstantinos Piccolas is asking um, which cases at the very end to evacuate endoscopically. Do you have any SOP to say, in this case, we do that, and in this case, we do that, or is it say, the preference of the neurosurgeon on call? Or do you think you should have an SOP if it's, it's not still very strictly regulated? I think we should have an SOP. Um, of course, it depends on um, the how the story evolves. And we, we did a lot of freehand drains into the clot, which is um, at least we didn't do any harm in the acute phase with the, um, um, hurting the perforators and enlargement of the clot. But now we switch more and more from the freehand drain to navigated drains and to, to endoscopic evacuation of the clot. What we try to do is we try to include as many patients as possible in studies. So we take part in the, in the penumbra and the MIND trial, and we are currently training our surgeons to do it. Um, Dr. Shah is an excellent endoscopic surgeon. He has the first seven or eight patients done with excellent results. And now he's mentoring um, other surgeons that, he, that they can um, fulfill the criteria for the mind try, and we include more and more patients endoscop with endoscopic surgery. So it takes time. Uh, again, <clears throat> a surgical question from Jordan. So we have a huge out outreach with our <laughs> webinar. Um, he said, my concern in surgery for ICH, the recurrence. Um, so how can you manage that with um, minimal invasive surgery or endoscopy? Um, with a microscopy, you can see better and coagulate the bleeder and prevent the recurrence of bleeding. What's your opinion about this? Patients and irrigation. Patients and irrigation. And 80 to 90% of, um, even in the ultra acute phase, of bleeding stops by itself. And then with the modern endoscopes, you can see as good or even better in the depth of the brain. And once you really had patients and did a lot of irrigation, you can coagulate the bleeder as well with the endoscope as with the microscope. But of course, it's an issue, but it, this is exactly what we surgeons can do. We can wait and we can coagulate specifically only the vessels that bleed. This is the key, not turning on the bipolar to, to a high water number and coagulate everything just the bleeder and only after lots of irrigation and lots of patients. My question is, uh, do you always see a bleeder? I've operated also a lot of, of hematomas uh, with a microscope and quite often after pulling out, sucking out the, the clot, I think that there was no clear bleeder. It was a hematoma cavity. I was rinsing the hematoma cavity um, and um, quite often there was not a clear bleeding source, which was also logical for me because the, 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 the vessels are very, very tiny and we have a quite huge pressure by the hematoma itself, which compresses uh, the bleeding normally. So what's your opinion or your experience? 
your personal experience on the topic? Same. In most patients, there is no single bleeding artery. In 80% of patients, um, you wait and see, and you don't see any bleeding bleeding vessels. So it's it's probably um, these 100 to 200 so to 500 microns, small, tiny vessels that have stopped bleeding once we are in the OR. And as the data um, that was produced by, by, by Rustam is that the most re-bleeding or probably it's a continuous bleeding happens in the initial phase of hemorrhage. So in the first 90 minutes to four hours, and we only rarely manage it into the OR in the first, in this very short period of time. And once you are there, you can handle this, this bleeding with irrigation and patients and only rarely localized targeted coagulation. Um, now there are two very important questions and quite difficult questions. Uh, what is your opinion on the potential use of DTI tractography uh, helping to minimize post of deficits in allocated areas and to improve the average volume um, of the residual hematoma? And I also would like to ask a question which is uh, close by. My question is a bit different. I hope before surgery, I always would like to differentiate between the patients who have a potential for recovery and those who have no potential because we have a primary brain damage and there will be no recovery of the motor function. It would be extremely good if we have any tool before surgery to say, okay, this patient had a salvageable uh, motor function and this patient not. Do we have um, <clears throat> any, any new insights that there's a technique coming up, an uh, electrophysiological monitoring tool coming up uh, to be able to differentiate? And uh, after this, after answering this, please come back to the question about the DTI uh, for um, yeah, um, differentiation of um, eloquent errors. Yeah, excellent question. No, there is no biomarker right now readily, uh, readily available for, for dichotomizing patients into good outcome and poor outcome. So we have to use that what we know, and this is location, so thalamus, capsula interna, size, and, and that's it basically. And you add then uh, patient characteristics, age, GCS, and, and the status before surgery, and then I think you have the best predictor. There is no role of DTI in the acute setting at the, at the moment, and there is no plasma marker, there is no electrophysiology. I think even if you are able to get a high quality MRI in an intubated sedation patients during the middle of the night for all these so frequent bleeds, you are not able to discriminate really is this, for instance, this uh, so important capsula interna viable or not. There is a lot of um, artifact in the vicinity of the blood. So it, you have a huge, tremendous um, logistic apparatus to, to put these patients in the MRI and there is probably no benefit at the moment. So for, for the time being, use what you have, use location and, and patient characteristics and size, and probably um, the most readily available advance will be using artificial intelligence, looking at the CTs or looking at the MRIs um, to, to summarize all this information. But a readily available biomarker, I'm not aware of any at the moment. Um, what is your experience with ultra early clot evacuation and stereotactic targeting of the spot sign? This question is coming from Mitun Satur. I think the, the spot sign, the black hole sign, the swirl sign, the finger sign, the irregularity sign, they are, they are over interpreted. And we had the excellent stop oust trials, RCTs that used Novo 7 again, like 10 years ago. Um, for only for patients with a positive spot sign. And it was completely disappointing, completely neutral. I think these most often in retrospective studies found signs, whatever the signs are, spot sign, black hole sign, and so on, they are over-interpreted. They won't help us in dichotomizing or selecting patients. Um, this is an opinion, but a clear opinion. 
And the second question was uh, ultra early surgery. Yeah. I think it's doable because we know then once we remove the clot, use irrigation, use patients, and then if it's still bleeding, local target coagulation. I think we shouldn't be afraid of ultra early surgery. We should do it in the setting of trials, clearly. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would like to, to support this opinion. Um, and um, for me, the, the, the repeated CD scan for proving the stability of the clot in all the studies, I think it's introducing already um, the problem of the poor results because it's, it's too lengthy, you're waiting too long. And um, I think if you're taking the hematoma out, um, irrespective if you're doing by the endoscope or with the fibrolytic therapy, uh, then you should not care too much about the clot stability because if it's out, and as I said, there normally there's no bleeding source, I think that the, the, there's no new upcoming problem. Okay, so now we are truly coming to the end with the question. The last question is dealing with um, the ICH and the CSF. Uh, Manuel Germans, Ben Germans, I don't know. Um, sorry about my um, little knowledge <laughs> to, 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 to spell or say the name. Uh, when the ICH comes in contact with the CSF in the ventricle of the fissure, it becomes more solid, which makes resection more difficult. What's your experience with these types of ICH and endoscope in, a way, in, the, in many million in waste surgery? Are we able to achieve the max 15 mil remnant? Yes, we are. Don't be afraid of surgery. I mean, that's what we should do. Yes, we are able of handling this. It's not too difficult to remove a clot. And it's not too difficult to remove, to remove a clot that has contact with CSF. You can do it. And, and do, do, in, in your experience, I, I have not made the experience uh, so often. In your experience, do you have seen that the CSF is contributing to a, let's say, firmer clot? Because I've learned, and this is uh, that, and then you can read it also in the papers, that CSF itself had some sort of a fibrinic uh, potential. So it can dissolve the clot. And therefore it makes sense. And we have published it also to connect the hematoma with the ventricular system as you um, have also shown it, not only for draining, but also for dissolving the clot. Same. It's, I don't have the experience that uh, CSF hardens or renders the clot more difficult. And um, as I have shown in this concept and in your, in your studies as well, um, it helps. CSF helps to wash out the clot, to put it simply. Okay. So the very last question, and then we, we stop the webinar. Um, I operate a case of ICH and post Operatively, the patient developed multiple bilateral scattered infarctions, uh, and at the very end, uh, it was discovered that it was a uh, vasculitis. Um, and um, as I'm rich, is asking if you have seen similar cases. Um, luckily, luckily not. Of course, we treat patients with vasculitis, but at least as I remember here from from um, sitting here. I haven't had the vasculitis case, uh, but this is bad luck. I mean, um, you will always, ha always have uh, patients that you only know in retrospect that would not be in surgical candidates. More often you find a tumor or you find an aneurysm or you find an AVM in younger patients. So of course this happens, of course. Okay. So I have seen that in the chat, uh, there are still two more, but then we stop. Um, when performing decompressive hemocranctomy, um, would it also be uh, reasonable to, to take the clot out? <laughs> this is, of course, um, our topic when we, Urs Fischer and myself and, and Christian and Andreas, we developed the switch trials. Um, as a neurosurgeon, you decompress the brain, you did a large operation, and you are not allowed to touch the brain. But this was the concept that, at least in these in these patients, the brain is vulnerable. If you go in, you have to coagulate or you, you, do, you induce more harm. This was at least the concept. And we don't know whether it works or not. We probably know it soon because I think in one year, at the latest, we have the final results. But um, this 
transfers to the concept that I was trying to show you. It's not only access to the lesion, it's surgery itself that matters, okay? Surgery deep down in the brain matters for outcome. But nowadays I'm, I'm convinced that probably um, the switch group is, is well, but a tiny subgroup of patients, probably only two to 3% of patients. And the majority, we should aim for surgical removal using minimal invasive techniques and minimal invasive techniques, not referring to the endoscope, referring to the bundle that we use, gentle irrigation, gentle pressure, don't harm tissue, no eloquent tissue, um, control end of treatment and so on. That's minimal invasive surgery. And the, la the very last question, <laughs> hopefully I uh, understood it right. I think the question is, when you start with uh, fibrolytic therapy after surgery? Um, surgery, uh, I mean, yeah, inserting- After, after, after <laughs> I think, putting in a catheter. Um, in the first hours. I think uh, in MISTI it was, uh, I don't remember, a couple of hours. Um, what you have, usually you have a hard time sucking the clot out or it's not oozing out constantly. So I'm not afraid to start with um, RTPA immediately. What we are doing, we are make, we're putting in the catheter, we are not sucking too much. Um, and then we go to a CT scan to see that the catheter is the correct position inside of the clot and then we start the fibrillar therapy right away. Okay, Jürgen, um, I think it was a successful webinar, still 170 participants also are uh, still are there. So many followed the discussion also. I think it was also a very good discussion and an excellent talk. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. See you soon for the next webinar of the West Coast section of the end. Thank you. Thank you, Fai. Thank you. Bye-bye. Greetings from Freiburg. Bye-bye.